All right, everybody, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just wanted to give everybody a couple extra minutes before we began. Um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Hatfield, and I'm the Government Affairs Director with the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals. And we want to thank everyone today who took the time to be on this webinar, uh, which is titled Tariffs and What It Means for Your Industry. We're pleased to be able to provide this, what we hope is an informative session to our members who have been or, or may be affected by the tariffs being imposed on certain products. Our hope is to provide insight on what has been and is occurring on the tariff front and steps, and steps one can take to apply for an exclusion. Unfortunately, we cannot take every APSP member through the process itself of applying and achieving an exclusion. This is due to the individual effects of tariffs on each company and the fact each company has a greater chance of being successful when addressing their individual circumstances. However, our hope today is to provide you, our members, the tools and guidance needed to navigate this complicated process in order to do so within your company. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation, and we will send you a copy of the PowerPoint after the session. Before we turn this over to our speaker today, I want to have someone else from our staff introduce herself. She's, our, she's new to our GR department, and we are very pleased to have her on board. Hi, everyone. My name is Reagan Ratliff. I'm the Government Relations Associate with APSP. I'm going to be monitoring the questions that come in today during the presentation. So if you go ahead and submit them, you can do that via the control panel under the questions tab. If you have any technical difficulties, just shoot me an email and I'll try to help out. And finally, the mute function should be on. But as a reminder, just have your computer or phone on mute. And I think that covers all housekeeping, so I'm going to turn it over to our presenter. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Carl Chidlow. I'm a lobbyist uh, in Washington, D.C., and have been representing the uh, association for, I believe, it's six years now on uh, numerous issues. Um, I'm making the assumption that uh, everyone on the call has been affected by these tariffs and one way or the other. So uh, let's begin the presentation and we'll hopefully provide some helpful guidance. Um, here's some brief background on the recent actions and these are related only to uh, US-China uh, uh, trade policy. Uh, some of you may have heard about um, uh, tariffs relating to uh, steel and aluminum imports. We don't plan on covering that today, but we could uh, you know, offer a follow-up conversation uh, to your company uh, if, if that is indeed the case. But just going through this um, real quick, uh, as you probably know, there's been three rounds of tariff actions with Chinese uh, retaliatory actions in kind. Um, perhaps some of you are on what we will refer to as the first list, uh, which went into effect um, on July. Uh, then there was a second round of an additional 16 billion that went into effect in August. Uh, the exclusion request forms for that, uh, for companies in that round uh, are not due till December 18th. And then Interestingly, there was another uh, even larger trade action uh, that took place uh, last month. Uh, the effective date of that was September 24th, and I do have some information on the third round. Uh, just Monday, uh, there was a letter sent to the USTR uh, trade representative signed by 169 uh, members of the House uh, in a very bipartisan manner. Uh, requesting that an exclusion request uh, process be put in place for the third round. Uh, so that is good news for those of you who find yourself on the third list, as we will call it. Uh, just some background. Um, we'd like to talk to you about how to apply and, and submit the exclusion request form. There are a couple of, um, you know, the only way to get relief uh, is, is to go through this process. Um, we understand that um, it's a complicated process, and we'll go through that uh, sort of line by line with you. But just some further background, um, you know, the, the trade relations with China have been uh, tense for many decades, and there was sort of growing 
political support uh, for some sort of uh, action. Um, this was something that uh, President Trump campaigned vigorously on, uh, and he is, you know, it should come as no surprise that he would follow through in some form or fashion. But unfortunately, uh, members of Congress uh, and folks here in Washington, D.C. have not seen anything of this magnitude since, I believe, the Nixon administration. Members of Congress who are your elected representatives have been basically caught off guard and were sort of hoping that, that nothing would occur, but this has uh, you know, been uh, very expeditious and people are, are essentially playing catch up uh, as we speak. And USTR, who are going to be reviewing these exclusion requests, uh, are incredibly understaffed, and they are only beginning to review uh, the first uh, batch of exclusion requests that were on the first uh, list that we mentioned. And I will also state that there were over 9,000 uh, requests made for just the first list. Uh, the second list hasn't been uh, closed out yet. Um, some of the, you know, one of the things that um, could provide relief uh, is is seeking, uh, you know, a, building a relationship with your member of Congress and your two U.S. senators. Um, USTR is going to evaluate these things at a snail's pace, and the only way to get an expeditious review is to have a member of Congress or a Senate office um, flagging it for USTR and calling over in a um, a regular uh, on a regular basis to expedite uh, the decision. Um, we'll flip to the next slide here. Uh, if you guys were on, if any of the member companies were on the first list, you're probably familiar with this form. This was uh, issued by the USTR and it is basically your application form. One of the key uh, things to include in here, and this is in the pull off slide in the yellow, uh, one of the criteria that USTR is going to um, take under consideration is can this exclusion request, if it is granted, can it be implemented? And what I mean by that is can, when the product is imported into a port of entry here in the United States, can a customs official at the port of entry identify the product? So it is incumbent upon you uh, to, you know, take photographs of the items, uh, describe it in great, uh, perhaps painstaking detail to allow uh, the greater chance that the customs agent can identify the product and if it has been excluded, uh, you know, move that sort of to the side. You know, just providing an HTS code uh, in your exclusion request form is not enough. Um, you need to provide a very vigorous uh, description, and we give you some guidance there, and we can, again, provide you further detail on that uh, in a follow-up. Um, you also need to be very accurate and honest uh, in this application. Um, as I mentioned, there are 9,000 requests and very few staff reviewing them. So my, my concern is that any opportunity that the USTR has to deny your request be based on what they perceive as false information or information that can be gathered elsewhere is going to greatly decrease your chances of, of getting uh, an exclusion request. So be honest, um, but going to this uh, third slide here on page three, this is really where the arguments can be made. Now, you're probably asking, what are persuasive arguments? Well, one we mentioned is, can it be identified at the port of entry? But here are some other things that we found have been helpful in conversations with uh, other companies. I think it's important for you to either begin or to continue investigating alternative sources of supply. This is a decision that all of you probably do not want to take or make, but it is important to articulate that to USTR and to your member of Congress, that you are investigating alternative sources. And if you have found domestic or foreign uh, other alternatives in a foreign supply chain, what are the prices? You know, is it five times, is it 10 times your current uh, source? Uh, another uh, very persuasive argument is, uh, you know, are any of your employees at risk? If this tariff policy continues, will you be forced to shut down uh, a portion of your operations? Will you have to lay off your employees uh, and hope for the best? Uh, if, you're, if you were able to find alternative sources of these materials, how long would it take to incorporate them into your supply chain? 
Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it five years? Also, remind them how long you've been, uh, you know, particularly for the member of Congress, how long have you been in operation? What is the history of your company? How many employees do you have total? And furthermore, if you are forced in the future to find alternative sources of supply, you know, um, how will you have to retool your operations? Will you have to bring in new equipment? Will you have to recalibrate your machinery? And if you do have to do that, or you estimate that you will have to do that, what is the approximate cost of that retooling operation? One thing that is a little more uh, esoteric, uh, we have heard anecdotal stories of uh, Chinese suppliers using, uh, you know, I wouldn't say retaliatory measures, but taking unusual actions uh, to demonstrate, uh, you know, their uh, lack of agreement with, with this policy. Let me put that in, in better words. Have the Chinese, have, has your supplier um, asked you for payment up front? Or have they said, we can no longer provide this at this price? Are, are they changing their behaviors in any way to you know, put pressure on your supply chain, to put pressure on your company? And I would view those anecdotal incidents as completely related to this situation. So if, if your Chinese suppliers have been uh, you know, asking for payment up front or some other um, means of creating additional difficulties, you know, articulate that uh, in this form and, and to your member of Congress when you get the meeting. Um, now, what you, I think you also need to prepare a narrative of what would happen if you do not receive this exclusion request. You know, are you competing currently against a, another Chinese product that is of similar make and perhaps a knockoff of your existing technology? Have you lost customers already because of the price fluctuations? Have any of your retailers that you source to, have they stopped uh, taking your product? Have they moved you off the shelf? You know, what has, what has been the immediate cause of this price fluctuation and how is it impacting you today? And if you have to uh, make drastic decisions, are you going to have to move your operations offshore? Are you going to have to relocate to Canada or Mexico or to another location? That, that would mean that your entire factory is gone uh, if you cannot get uh, this specific relief. And if you were able to find other sources of materials, um, how long would it take to bring those online and to do the testing and verification necessary to pass U.S. safety standards? You know, th these supply chains that you've developed uh, may have been decades in the making. This is a, a change that has happened in the last 12 months. What would it take for you to, to change your supply sourcing behavior? That could take years. And you need to be able to articulate that you need this ex exclusion. You need this one year of relief in order to make some of these changes. You can't do it under the current environment. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, a campaign promise that the president uh, has, is, is acting on, but Congress is not to blame. You may be angry across the board, but it's your member of Congress and your senators that are going to be able to have the best chance of providing you with relief. And they can help. So you need to immediately investigate who your member of Congress is, and that's what this next slide will demonstrate. Uh, it's a very easy process, and if you already have an existing relationship, I ask that you start exploiting it immediately. But if you've never visited with your member of Congress before, um, take a look at this slide. You can plug in your zip code and find your member of Congress uh, almost immediately. Most members of Congress, or actually all of them, have staff located in your congressional district. Many con Congress people have multiple offices spread throughout your congressional district. There should be one within an hour's drive or less of your location. So find that office, call there immediately, and begin asking for an in-person meeting to discuss your situation. Most uh, members of Congress have assigned staff particularly to this uh, issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to want to seek out uh, who, who I would describe as the trade staffer. Uh, schedule an in-person meeting as soon as possible because you need to explain this uh, eyeball to eyeball. 
um, and ask your member of Congress to write a letter. Here's a, here's a sample uh, that we'd like to provide to you, but you can put this in your own words. And you should have an in-person meeting followed up uh, by a request to, to submit a letter on behalf of your uh, exclusion request application. This is going to be a long process, so it's it's important to not get frustrated with the process. Well, you can get frustrated with the process, but not with your member of Congress or your senator. Once you receive the exclusion request form, there's going to be multiple other hurdles uh, along this narrative, and you're going to need their support um, down the road. So don't take it out on them, uh, is my point. Um, here are some relevant links uh, that will help you if, you if you're not familiar with the exclusion request form or uh, further background, there's a link to find your, your member of Congress. Um, but let me give you a couple of uh, pieces of advice on how to achieve this meeting with your member of Congress uh, in short order. First of all, you guys are active uh, in the community. You've had a business presence there. You're an economic engine in this congressional district. But you have a Rolodex on your desk, or maybe it's an electronic uh, version of that. But you need to start sort of cataloging what are the relationships you have that perhaps are tied into the political community. Um, is there a member of your board of directors that is politically active or an investor? Uh, don't be afraid to sort of climb the ladder and start small. Do you know someone on the school board, the PTA, your city council, a state representative? president of the local chamber of commerce. All of these people should be able and willing to help you achieve a meeting with your senators and your member of Congress at a very senior level. It's important to not sort of cold call if it's, if it's avoidable, but have one of these prominent uh, members of the community walk you in and, and get you the meeting so that you can start at a senior level. Um, the best people to, to sit down with in the first run is uh, what I would describe as the chief of staff. Now that, that person is usually located in Washington, DC, so perhaps you can get a phone call to begin the process with the chief of staff in Washington. But even more uh, important and perhaps more effective is a, an in-person meeting with a, with a title called the district director. The district director runs all constituent service operations in that congressional district or in that state. Uh, the district director knows the politics of the region. They're, they're, they're much more close uh, to uh, you know, what's going on on the ground than even the chief of staff is in Washington, DC. So when you're working your Rolodex and, and asking for this meeting, getting a sit down with the district director is, is a great place to start. Um, you may know a former member of Congress or a town elder or somebody who's retired from politics. Those are also people who will know and perhaps even have the cell phone number of the district director. So work your way up the ladder and make sure when you walk in with this meeting that you have some political support behind you. Uh, speaking about of those other sort of activist folks in, in your community. Um, make sure that you bring a example of your product, whether it's a photographic uh, image or if it's not something that's 500 pounds, you know, try to bring it to the meeting. If it's a pump, if, if it's a motor, if it's a filter, if it's anything in the pool industry that you can carry with you to the meeting and bring it, put it on the table and walk them through what parts are made in China, what parts are assembled here, what you do here versus what is done overseas and walk them through the product and how it is critical that this uh, item continues to be manufactured in the United States. One thing that I've also found that is incredibly persuasive is that out of the global pool supply uh, or, or pool use market, let's say, two thirds of residential commercial uh, pools are here in the United States. So you need to stay close to that market. It's the world's largest market. Um, so you, you can't afford to move overseas, nor do you want to but two thirds of, of, of all your customers are here in the United States and that's why you wanna stay here. Here's another thing that's incredibly persuasive. Uh, gather your workers together in the next day or two and just take a photograph. You know, putting faces and images to this narrative is critical. You need to bring that photograph to this meeting with your member of Congress and say, look, 
these are the these are the families that are going to be in, affected. Uh, it's not just about my bottom line, but it's about these employees who work the line every day. So bring a photograph and say these people are going to lose their jobs if I don't get this exclusion. And invite the member of Congress or even the staff to visit your factory or or your assembly plant. Get them to put eyes on the situation, not not just for demoing the product in their office, but invite them to come and visit you and meet with the employees. Um, give them your physical location so that they can imagine where you are in the in, in their congressional district. And then finally, and 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 not at all the least, talk about how you are active in the community. Do you sponsor the local little league? Are you involved in other charities? Um, do you do community events? You know, what is your annual salary and payroll that impacts the community? Just so they understand how deeply immersed you are in their congressional district or in their state. But here, here's the real argument. You need time to adjust. It's not that you're unwilling, but you cannot do the, make these decisions under duress. You need this one year exclusion in order to allow yourselves to continue investigating other sources, you know, line up additional financing if that is necessary, you know, meet with your investors, meet with your board of directors so that, you know, in the future, if, if this is a prolonged uh, trade action, that you have time uh, to make the decisions to allow you to continue to, to be a, a vigorous part of this community. And, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, small, innovative companies uh, such as yours are what built this country. And now you need your member of Congress uh, to protect that. This one, you have to apply for the exclusion if there is ever any chance for relief. Um, so with that, um, I know I've talked quite a bit. I'm going to pause and allow uh, Reagan and Jen to open it up for some questions. Oh, and here's our last slide, excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll start a Q&A session. We thank everybody who's joined. Uh, and then if you have additional questions, please call Jen or Reagan uh, or contact them at this email address. So with that, we'll open it up for, for Q&A. All right, thank you, Carl. Uh, appreciate that. Um, first question received is, what if your company is affected by the third tariff list where an exclusion process currently doesn't exist? So what guidance can you give, Carl? Great. Um, thank you for that question. And um, as, I, as I mentioned on the front end, uh, there is not currently a exclusion process for the third list, uh, which is by far the largest. But uh, just on Monday, uh, some of the thought leaders in Congress uh, sent a letter to the USTR. It was signed by 169 bipartisan members of the House, um, you know, strongly suggesting that the USTR uh, develop an exclusion uh, request form for list three. Uh, that's over, that's about 40% of the entire Congress. Um, we were in meetings last week where the uh, agitation on creating an exclusion request for the third round is, is you know, uh, gaining momentum. I think with the issuance of this letter on Monday, you will see in the coming weeks uh, an exclusion request uh, form become available uh, for the third list. It, it's not currently available. There was some discussion that we got wind of that they weren't going to include uh, an exclusion request for list three uh, to sort of keep the pressure up. But my sense is with 40% of Congress putting their name on a letter that that exclusion request process will be implemented. I can't say soon, but it, it will be, uh, it will become a fact of life. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, another question we've received is, if you were on the first list and didn't realize these steps were available to you until now, what can a company do? Great question. Um, I would still uh, seek a meeting with your member of Congress. I am absolutely certain that you are not alone in that situation. Um, you know, sit down with your member of Congress, explain to them where they are, uh, explain that, you know, 
whatever it is that you know you thought this wasn't really going to happen or you were hoping it was going to resolve itself um but you know engage with your member of congress regardless um there there are probably hundreds if not thousands of companies that are similarly si situated i think a lot of people were sitting on the sidelines waiting for this to blow over so engage with your member of congress and get creative um explain to them that you're not cur <coughs> currently in the system but see if there's a way that they can petition USTR for you to um you know file post facto uh, don't don't give up don't just sit and suffer in silence talk to your member of congress talk to your senator you know there's always a way if there's political pressure to do so All right, thank you, Carl. Another question: if, if an exclusion is granted, and will then will my company be reimbursed for tariffs already collected? Uh, these are all great questions. Thank you for that. Um, my understanding, and this has not been um, adjudicated yet; uh, it, it has not been put in place yet. But our understanding is that uh, if your exclusion request is granted, and Customs is able to identify the products that's a big if, uh, that there will be a system put in place, um, Lord knows when, and you, you will be granted uh, a refund of some sort from an agency that is yet to be determined, but that refund will go back to the date that the tariffs were first enacted. So let's say you're on the second list um, and you haven't even filed your exclusion request form yet. Um, if that, request is granted, um, you know, the, the products that were, um, that the tariffs were collected on will be retroactively refunded back to the date where the tariff started. So in the case of the second list, you know, as of August 23rd. Um, so that process is yet to be thought through. Nobody that I've talked to on Capitol Hill who's following this very closely knows how that's going to work. And I will tell you, it will be a mess, um, for lack of a better term. But that is another reason why you need to engage with your member of Congress, not only to get the exclusion request granted in an expeditious way, but to work with you following the exclusion to collect that refund. And that's going to be a multi-agency issue. So only your member of Congress is situated to do that. They're going to have to go back to customs and look at your importation sheets and match them up and it's going to be messy it's going to be incredibly sloppy um, I, I will make an editorial comment right now which is this whole process was not very well thought out but again getting back to uh, your member of congress they will be able to work with you interfacing with customs uh, to match up what you believe was collected um, versus what they believe was brought in and and matching that up sometime in the future um, but it's going to be a sloppy mess and you're going to need congressional backing uh, to make sure that you get those dollars back that have been you know added onto your supply chain and and make sure it works in your favor don't expect that to work itself out on its own that's probably the most important reason to get your member in, of Congress involved is to, to get you through that refund uh, escrow process, however it's going to take place. I hope I answered that uh, question. Okay, Carl, thank you. I have, I have several questions that have come in uh, just in the last few minutes. I'm trying to get them in order. So let me um, go over the next one. And in the latest third round of tariffs, which adds 10%, is this 10% added to the classification tariff already in place? Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So, so if, if that HTS code product is coming in at, let's say, a 5% ad valorem, it, it, it's now 15%, if that makes sense. Uh, the other, the other uh, tricky part with the third round is that the tariffs, the additional tariffs are now 10% more uh, than the ad valorem, 
but at the end of this calendar year, December 31st, they're going to jump up to 25%. That is part of the reason why, as I mentioned, almost 170 members of Congress have weighed in saying that there has to be an exclusion request process for the third list. Um, if that ratchets up to 25% on, on January 1st, uh, that's going to make a whole world of hurt uh, for the companies that are on that list. Um, so uh, yes, it's 10% it's currently above the current uh, ad valorem. And to clarify it, Carl, so then that means it's the first of the year when the tariffs go to 25%. Is that in addition to the classification? So is it 25% on top of as well, or is it just 25%? No, it, it, for the third list, it's currently 10% above. On December 31st, it'll go to 25% above. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we've received is, is there any insight on if and when the tariffs may be repealed or what have to happen to have them repealed? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, so I'm going to uh, speak on a little bit of background first. Um, you know, the, the tariffs vis-a-vis uh, -vis China are just one piece of, of a larger trade complicated puzzle that the president has created. Um, you may have read uh, or heard background noise about a renegotiation of the NAFTA uh, deal with Canada and Mexico. The reason why I mention that is that, you know, relations or trade, a trade agreement has been struck with Canada and Mexico on what I would call NAFTA 2.0. But here's, here's the kicker. The Senate and the House of Representatives need to vote on that package in order for the new uh, agreement to take place. It doesn't just take place because the president uh, said it did. Uh, Congress gets an opportunity to weigh in very significantly on trade writ large. So the new NAFTA deal uh, is not going to be uh, worked out in terms of legalese and uh, the particulars of it until January at the earliest. Uh, but Senator McConnell, who's the leader of the Senate Republicans, uh, mentioned that it is going to be at the top of their agenda uh, when the new Congress takes office in January. My point is this. Members of Congress are going to be approached by the administration, both Democrats and Republicans, to be asked to support this new NAFTA agreement. That is their opportunity to um, negotiate with the administration on other issues. And in particular, we want them to be positioned and educated well enough to say, sure, uh, Mr. President, or sure, uh, Trade Ambassador, we're, we're gonna consider voting for NAFTA 2.0, but we need you to take care of these companies in my backyard. They've got an exclusion request form pending. I want that looked at, I want that taken care of, and then you'll get my vote on NAFTA. Now, not every member of Congress is going to be that bold, but you need to be on a, on a list, so to speak, within that congressional uh, member's office, within that Senate office of affected companies, so that if there is an opportunity to bargain on the NAFTA vote, which is January, February of next year, that is when Congress is going to be able to reassert their authority. That is one sort of brinksmanship uh, opportunity coming up. So that's why it's incumbent upon you, and I sound like a broken record, to get in their face between now and the end of the year. The second chance that this could all go away, which I think everybody on this call is hoping for, is if the Chinese and basically the president come to some face-saving agreement where everybody can agree that we're going to have a better trade relationship, and it allows the president to declare victory. I would not see that happening between now and the congressional midterms, which are in three weeks. I don't see that happening until, unfortunately, January, when NAFTA is going to be uh, looked at. But there will be a time, I hope, and this is a very big caveat, I hope, when the Chinese, you know, offer some, uh, you know, adjustments, uh, some ways for the president to, to say that he made them buckle um, and, 
you know, then this could, you know, fade into the background. There's also the other possibility that, that this continues um, as long as Trump is president. Um, Congress will eventually begin reasserting their authority. This letter that I mentioned earlier is an example of that, but that is not gonna take place until the next Congress takes effect in January. Um, so you're, you're gonna be dealing with this for a while, but there, is, there are things for you to, you to do, which is get the exclusion request form done, get with your member of Congress, bring them up to speed, get them to buy into your situation and exert some political capital on your behalf. Yes, there is a chance this could blow over is a long winded answer, but the NAFTA vote coming up is gonna be a point uh, where changes may happen. And then it's, it's all up to the president and the Chinese when they agree that they've both gotten what they want. But I don't have a date certain is the short answer. All right, thanks, Carl. We've got three more questions left. Before I go through those, I just wanted to remind everybody once again, we've had a couple people that may have joined late, that um, you know, everyone, all the attendees are muted, but you can ask questions through the control panel on the GoToWebinar, you know, on your panel on the computer. Um, we're also going to be happy to, at the end here, I'll remind everybody of, of the emails of Reagan's are mine, so you can email us after the fact. And another quick housekeeping is that we are going to be emailing everyone this presentation. Um, you'll get it by tomorrow, so that way you have this to refer back to. Um, and there also will be a recording of this presentation that we uh, are going to look to provide as a member benefit as well, because some people couldn't make today's call. So I just want to remind everybody of those things. But with that, let me um, get to our last three questions. And, and like I said, but we still have some more time if anybody else has any others they want to type in. So, um, Carl, we've gotten a question that says, if our Chinese supplier considers opening a factory here in the U.S. in the next five years, can we get a longer term exclusion? Uh, great question. Um, my understanding uh, is that the exclusion, well, my understanding is that the exclusion is for one year, but uh, when that year expires that you can apply for a second year. Uh, that is the understanding as of today. Um, right now the form is only set up to take a one year look at it, um, but again, um, and I hate to repeat myself, um, explore that with your member of Congress. You know, you'll, the best case scenario is you're granted one year and then based on the changes you're, you're investigating, a second year can be granted. Um, but it's going to be on a, on a, you know, in one year increments, there's no opportunity under the current model uh, for you to ask for a multi-year extension. All right. Thank you, Carl. Um, as a pool construction company, uh, they're experiencing price increases coming from most of their suppliers due to the tariff situation. Uh, and they want to know how can they combat these increases from a domestic supplier? And further, can a construction company gain relief directly from the exclusion process? Um, okay, so I think I understand. Um, you know, the, the steel and aluminum uh, tariffs that were, you know, worldwide, um, that, that issue has not resolved itself yet. And that could be what is um, factoring into your construction costs. Um, your suppliers uh, of perhaps steel or aluminum, they can seek relief uh, under a different system uh, through the U.S. Um, uh, Commerce Department. Um, but you as a company individually, unless you import something directly from China, um, there, is, there is no relief. Um, these supply chain fluctuations, these price fluctuations are part of, uh, you know, a broader issue relating to steel and aluminum perhaps. But, you know, the companies that you're sourcing from, um, they can seek relief. Whether they pass that on to you or not uh, is another matter. But you, as, a, as an end user of multiple products, 
cannot seek an exclusion request. It, it has to be for a particular product that is imported from China. Uh, or if, if you have a company that's sourcing aluminum or steel from China or Canada or elsewhere, they might be seeking relief, but they may not be passing on those savings to you. I'm sorry there's not a better answer to that. Thanks, Carl. That uh, Our last question as of right now would be, can you update a request with additional information once it's filed and the window is closed? That is a great question as well. Um, again, there is currently not a model for, for doing that, uh, but again, getting back to engagement with your member of Congress, you know, as you're investigating alternative supply chain sources, as you're investigating, um, you know, whether to retool your factory, I, I think it's, it's very reasonable to suggest that new information has come, become available in your due diligence. So use your member of Congress to take that additional information and include that uh, in a letter or in an email to the USTR and that I believe can be attached to your current submittal. You know, this is not a moment in time situation and everybody is scrambling to uh, figure things out. So there is not a formal process for updating your, your form, but you can work your member of Congress to say, hey, look, here's, here's what I submitted months ago. My information has changed. Can you forward this to USTR uh, so that they can review this additional information about you know, my timeline or my supply chain. Um, that is really the only method to do it right now. You could try to submit it through the USTR portal, but it, it may or may not be matched up with your previous submittal. So again, work your member of Congress, get them to forward the new information in there as it is relevant. Okay, thank you, Carl. Um, just double checking if there's any other questions. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the entire session today has been recorded. So the Q&A portion of this presentation will be available via the recording. I know someone's asked if they could also get a copy of that and we will work to also uh, incorporate the questions and answers today into a written document as well. Um, that may take us a few more days. So in the, in the interim, we will uh, get the PowerPoint to you itself, but we will make sure everything today is available to you in, in one way or the other. Um, and so with that, I think we've answered all the questions today. Um, we did get a second question about, again, the timing of when you, with these tariffs remaining in effect. Um, and I know Carl had, had kind of responded to an earlier question similar to that. But Carl, maybe before we close, do you want to just kind of clarify again on the on the on that aspect? Yeah, and and I'm going to get into the realm of editorializing here a little bit. Um, I, I believe that um, the you know again this was an administration driven uh, policy. Uh, Congress really had no say. Uh, in how this was uh, uh, put into place. Um, but Congress, uh, I think across the board and in a bipartisan way, is getting incredibly frustrated. Um, an example of this is uh, that letter I mentioned earlier. But, um, you know, I believe that the president thinks he's winning this war. Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence uh, to suggest that the Chinese economy is being uh, affected. Uh, what we have to understand is that, you know, the, the way the Chinese make decisions is over a thousand years. They, they have a much longer um, understanding of where their country wants to go. Uh, it is still basically a totalitarian state, a one-party state. They have various levers uh, with which to manipulate their economy that are not available to U.S. policymakers. 
So their ability, China's ability to sort of tough this out um, is probably uh, a longer time horizon. Uh, but what I sense is, is occurring here, and again, this is editorializing, is that um, companies such as yours are coming to the forefront and, are, are, and the, no member of Congress wants to see headlines in their local paper about uh, layoffs or small factories that have been around for 50 years having to shut their doors or, or cease production. Uh, and, and certainly nobody wants to see U.S. Uh, you know, companies lose out to knock off uh, Chinese competition that is now of a lower price due to the tariffs. Um, this, is, this is essentially a large mess that eventually will get cleaned up. Um, but until the president believes that he is uh, able to declare victory, unless there is sort of some change in the political dynamic, uh, unless Congress uh, in a bipartisan fashion is willing to, you know, uh, pass legislation or, you know, uh, disrupt what the, what the president is doing, um, you know, things need to change in order, for, uh, in order for this to go away. I think the Chinese can tough this out a lot longer than we can. We make policy decisions based on four-year election cycles. Uh, but the, as I said, the Chinese have a thousand year view of history. So the, again, I don't know when this will be resolved. One example is this, um, with the negotiation of the NAFTA deal, there were certain political deadlines that were taking place both in Mexico and China. And then we have our own political deadline coming up here, which are the midterm elections. That precipitated all three sides to come to an agreement uh, to appease, you know, the business community in their home countries. Uh, that sort of alignment of the planets has not happened yet on the China side. So, um, you know, I think it'll occur next year. Um, the president also has to stand for reelection uh, in less than 24 months or roughly 24 months from now. Um, so he's going to want to be able to declare victory of some sort. I don't think he wants to have this disruptive economic situation going on as he prepares to run for re-election. I, I can't say if it's going to be two years, one year, six months, but something's going to give, and once it does, um, then things could return to normal. Now, has the disruption of the supply chain, has the... Um, bad blood between the two companies gotten resolved? I don't know. Um, again, those are all editorial statements. Um, but again, sounding like a broken record, fuse your member of Congress, get your senators to understand where you are situated in this situation. There's an old African proverb that uh, I read in one of the trade journals, and it goes like this. Uh, when the elephants are fighting, it's always the grass that gets trampled. Unfortunately, small companies such as yourselves are the grass in that metaphor. Um, I think you understand who the elephants are. So, you know, your member of Congress can help. Uh, that's what they are elected to do. This is a constituent service that they are supposed to provide. I can't tell you that it's gonna be uniform response across the board, but you have to start now. Uh, they're not gonna call you, you need to call them. And you know, with however many millions of dollars you pump into the local economy, they need to listen. So start that process now. If you need some advice down the road as to how to make that more effective, please get back in touch with Jen and, and Reagan and I. We can give you some other thoughts but it's not a one size fits all situation. Every company is uniquely situated. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll close my mouth. <laughs> all right, thank you, Carl. Um, I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed the, pres the presentation today. I hope it's insightful and helpful to each of your companies. We appreciate you taking the time to have, have joined us. Um, as a reminder, I know I've repeated this a couple of times, but just to make sure you're aware, we will be sending out the, a copy of the PowerPoint to all who uh, registered to attend today. 
Um, there also is going to be a recorded version of this that we are going to look to get out. And, and lastly, you know, we will look into putting together a document with the eight or nine questions received today. So you have that as well. Um, and as Carl already mentioned, you know, the last page of the PowerPoint still on the screen, if you're, if you're watching, provides both mine and Reagan's uh, contact information, as well as the direct line to APSP. So if you have any other questions that you think about after the presentation today, feel free to reach out to us and we'll do what we can to assist. So if there's nothing further, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and, and want to thank everyone again and have a wonderful rest of your day.